Ping, UIC Law, okay. My name is Terry McMurtry Chubb and I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development at the Law School and it is my extreme pleasure to welcome to us today, Senator Dick Durbin. Uh, Senator is a, yes, please. <laughs> The senator is a Democrat from Springfield, is the 47th U.S. Senator from the state of Illinois, the state's senior senator, and the convener of Illinois' bipartisan congressional delegation. Durbin also serves as the Senate Majority Whip, the second highest ranking position among the Senate Democrats. Senator Durbin has been elected to this leadership post by his Democratic colleagues every two years since 2005. Durbin serves as the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee and sits on the Appropriations and Agricultural Committees. Elected to the U.S. Senate on November 5th, 1996, and re-elected in 2002, 2008, 2014, and 2020, Durbin fills the seat left vacant by the retirement of his longtime friend and mentor, U.S. Senator Paul Simon. Senator Durbin makes approximately 50 round trips per year between Washington and Illinois. He is married to Loretta Schaefer Durbin, their family consists of three children, Christine, deceased, Paul, and Jennifer, as well as six grandchildren. They reside in Springfield. So without further ado, Senator Durbin. Thank you. Some of you, can, miss, can you hear me? Yeah. Some of you uh, have heard my quick bio biography here. I, I will mention a thing or two about my law, law school experience. Uh, Georgetown Law is one of the larger uh, law schools by enrollment, at least was, and I think still is. And I, I'm thinking that maybe there were 450 or 600 in our freshman class. It was huge. And they thoughtfully divided us by alphabet. So I know everybody who went to law, law school A through J. I don't know who those other people were. <laughs> they were. They were in other parts of the building. And we had these large lecture halls, as you can imagine, 150 people or more. Uh, I would say that in our entire class of 450 to 500 students, we may have had 10 women, just to give an idea. Uh, and I recall in our section, one minority, African-American man. And, and we didn't have, now they have health clubs and everything else at the law school there. Uh, we used to have a vending machine room where you could buy for 25 cents coffee made in a vending machine. You can imagine how good that was. And I would go in there to eat a sandwich for lunch and this fellow was sitting there, this one African-American who was in our class and kind of by himself and reading his books. And I said, can I interrupt you and introduce myself? I said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, he said, uh, I'm just finished my engineering degree and I'm hoping to get into patent law. And I thought, <laughs> That's not my ambition, and I certainly respect him, and I hope he made it, and I'm sure he did uh, along the way. Uh, but uh, it was a different time. We were in the midst of the Vietnam War, and if you didn't maintain your student status, you were gonna maintain your army status. Uh, and that was something that was looming over all the men uh, who were going to school at that time. I talked a little bit here, and I won't repeat the stories. Let me try to fast forward to where I am now. This is my 26th year in the United States Senate, 14 years in the House before that. If it sounds like I'm a career politician, I am, okay? I used to run away from that and say, oh no, I just happened to be, no, I can't, can't make any excuses. Uh, I practiced law and I enjoyed it, but I'm practicing politics now and I love it. Uh, and I've come to the conclusion in my own life, by my own values, that uh, life isn't measured by how many toys you collect. Uh, life is measured by satisfaction in your work and the belief that you have some role, play some role uh, in an important way uh, in dealing with people you live with and changing the world. I couldn't ask for more than to be the United States Senate, uh, Senator from Illinois. Uh, and it's been a remarkable experience. Uh, it creates a lot of opportunities, as you might imagine. I could go through them, but it'd be boring to do so. But the one thing that people are surprised to learn is that last year, my 39th year on Capitol Hill, was the first year that I came to chair a committee. 39 years waiting in the wings, uh, always with a nice subcommittee, but never the committee chair. I couldn't have asked for a better assignment than to be chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. 
my image of that committee goes back to my first knowledge of Capitol Hill and the Senate. The Judiciary Committee always seemed to be in the middle of everything important, whether it was Supreme Court nominations or debating important bills or investigations, it was always the Senate Judiciary Committee. And that fell by the wayside in recent years. And I've tried in the first year, a few months, to restore the role of the committee. I might also add one thing here that I want to be sure to tell you. Most people, when they run for the United States Senate, never think about some of the things that come with it. Uh, the House was a great experience. I would do it all over again. The Senate, you get a longer term and uh, same pay, uh, but it, it really gives you some time to uh, do some things rather than prepare for the next reelection, which in the House is always looming over you. And the other thing about the Senate that people don't think about, and I didn't at all when I ran for the Senate, was the impact you can have if you were there for a length, lengthy period of time on the judiciary. Across the street in that courthouse, when they gathered together, the judges in the district court uh, for the Northern District of Illinois or Central District or Southern District and put them all up there, I look at it and say, I had a hand in choosing 85% of these people. So uh, over a period of time, you really cast the image and profile of the court by your selections. And I'm proud of what we've accomplished over the years with one or two notable exceptions and there will always be a, somebody who breaks your heart but with one or two notable exceptions, we have a great judiciary with few vacancies and more diversity than ever in history. Uh, I'm proud to say that I picked the first African-American U.S. Marshal for the Northern District of Illinois. It may not sound like much, but the fact of the matter is over decades, the U.S. Marshal's office had conveniently transferred every African-American who had emerged through the ranks and were ready to take over. They would transfer them to Toledo get them out of town. They were never gonna be in the Northern District. We broke that in two or three or four different times now. We filled that spot with an African-American uh, and that's the way it should be. The reason that is apropos, of course, is we're in the midst now of making history in Washington if we can get it done. 115 Supreme Court justices, 108 of them look like me, a white guy. But out of the 115, we've never had an African-American woman it goes without saying that if you're going to be the first, you've got to be the best and be prepared for hell on wheels and trying to get that final step into the position. The choice by President Biden uh, is an excellent choice. Uh, the resume of uh, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson is extraordinary, as you can guess. Clerked at every level of the federal judiciary, including for uh, Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, whose vacancy she hopes to fill served uh, at both the district and circuit court levels, DC circuit, was on the sentencing commission, which is considered one of the more cerebral but important assignments. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, Harvard Law, after Harvard undergrad, uh, a remarkable person. Her husband, uh, Dr. Patrick Jackson, is the head of surgery at Georgetown University Hospital. She has two daughters who accompanied her at the hearing. Uh, I want to tell you, if you, you were looking for a perfect resume, you, you wouldn't go much further than, than this nominee. Uh, and I, Joe Biden, who is a friend, President Biden, who is a friend, really extended to me and every other senator any suggestions you have. Uh, he had made a commitment to pick an African-American woman, but he said to me, do you have anybody in mind? And I said, you've got some great ones. He had three that they're being actively considered. So she comes before the committee this last week, as most of you know, uh, and I did not know her well. She had been before the committee last year uh, in her uh, seeking the DC circuit, uh, but this year is different. When you get to this level, things change in terms of the scrutiny. She's been approved uh, with bipartisan support three different times by the Senate Judiciary Committee. This fourth time is a different ball game completely as you saw this week. Uh, there were elements in her resume and experience that were explored in graphic detail. She came at an unusual time uh, politically because there's still vivid memories of some recent Supreme Court appointments. Uh, Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh, which was a, I hope, unique situation. I hope we never go through it again, 
where in the midst of the deliberation during the August recess of the Senate, uh, Senator Feinstein receives a letter from a woman who says that uh, she believes that there was a case of sexual harassment by Justice Kavanaugh when they were both in high school. And the woman uh, reaches a point where she is prepared to testify under oath. Senator Feinstein, I think, should have been advised to turn that letter over immediately to the FBI. She didn't. She tried to deal with it directly to ascertain whether or not it was true or not. There was no malice involved in that. She, it was the Me Too era, and you would take these things seriously if, if they're true, but you owed it to the person accused to at least verify that there was some truth to it. So caught in that dilemma, she tried on her own without speaking to any other member of the committee to deal with the issue. By the time we returned at the end of August uh, to resume consideration of Justice Kavanaugh, the letter was about to break in the press. It had been there several weeks uh, in, in private and in Washington, hardly anything's kept secret for any lengthy period of time. That's when all hell broke loose and I won't recount all the things that occurred, but the Republicans involved in the process uh, were offended that the suggestion was even made uh, or that we went through the lengthy hearings uh, where the complainant came forward and other evidence was taken. I don't think we could have done anything else. To ignore it would have been impossible and uh, inadvisable. Uh, and if someone is willing to testify under oath as to what happened, it isn't just a casual rumor. It's, it's serious. Uh, anyway, Justice Kavanaugh, as you know, was approved, sent to the court. Uh, Amy Coney Barrett came uh, next, and uh, she had been before the committee. I want to say one word about that. I don't want to take too much time. I want to open it to questions. But I'm Catholic, 19 years of Catholic education. Sometimes this church doesn't claim me, but I claim them. That's uh, <laughs> the nature of my religion. Uh, and so Amy Coney Barrett comes before the committee. Now, question comes up on the issue of religion. The Constitution has two, two or three basic references to religion, and they are really powerful. The government of the United States will not establish a religion. Our founding fathers saw what happened with the Anglican Church in England and didn't want the same here. So there's no establishment of official religion in the United States. Secondly, you are free to practice your religion, whatever it may be. And many of the colonists and colonies like uh, uh, Maryland, which obviously became a state, were escaping persecution for their religious belief, whether Quakers or Catholics or whatever it might be. So you have establishment, free exercise, and third provision, which says there basically will be no religious test for public office. No religious test for public office. Those are the three things that, that are expressly stated in that constitution about religion. Now comes Amy, Amy Cody Barrett, and she is on the faculty at Notre Dame Law School. And in research, we find an article that she co-wrote with a man who was then the uh, dean of Catholic University Law School, which basically concluded she was uh, either a student or brand new out of law school, uh, participating in the writing of this article. Her name was on it. And it said the following, if you are an Orthodox Catholic and a judge, you cannot sentence someone to death. So all of a sudden, things start lighting up on the scoreboard. Wait a minute. So it, there's no religious test, but they have written an article suggesting that if you are of a certain religion, you could not exercise your responsibility as judge when it came to the imposition of the death penalty. Analogize that to someone who says, I'm Muslim, and I could never convict anyone uh, for terrorism if they're going to be killed. Well, now comes the clash between the Constitution, which says hands off on religion, and an express statement that really involves religion in the, in the pursuit and practice of an office. So questions were asked of Amy Coney Barrett. And I asked some, some of the questions. Uh, I asked first, what is an Orthodox Catholic? I'm 19 years in this business of being a Catholic, and I've never heard the term before. Well, she explained it in her own terms as someone who ad adheres to the tenets of faith, I, I guess more faithfully than some, uh, whatever it might be. But 
So there was some controversy. She was approved as circuit court judge, but the issue of religion came up in that process. When she came up for Supreme Court justice, I will tell you, the Democrats took a hands-off attitude toward that issue. She had spoken, it was on the record, it was just uh, years before, and we didn't raise the issue at all. But you, you would think that it was the center point of the debate on her approval for the uh, Supreme Court. It was not, intentionally so. We just decided it had been covered, asked and answered at that point. She made it through in record time uh, in a matter of uh, 36 days from the declaration of the vacancy until she came on the court, a much shorter period of time than even this nominee. And so all of these things, starting with Robert Bork and moving to this day, accumulated into the process uh, before our Senate Judiciary Committee. A word about the committee before I sit down and answer your questions. What a challenge this is, 22 members, 11 Democrats, 11 Republicans. Uh, which means that under the committee rules, you're at the mercy of the minority. The Republicans are the minority, not in number, but in fact, if Kamala Harris tying breaking vote in the Senate chamber gives us the technical majority, but not the real majority, either in the chamber or on the committee. It means that I've, I'm in a position where I'm trying to chair a committee where I really don't have enough of an army behind me to win the political arguments. I got one break, uh, maybe more than one, but one that I really appreciate. My ranking Republican member is Chuck Grassley of Iowa. He is my friend. I like him, I really do. We have a trusting relationship and uh, I've worked with him ever since I came to the committee. Yes, he's a conservative Republican, but he's an honorable man and uh, his word is good. He's never misled me and I've told him I'll never knowingly mislead him. Uh, and not stab him in the back. We discussed everything in advance, so he knows what's coming. When he was interviewed and asked about this committee hearing, I was gratified that he said two different interviews uh, to describe his relationship with me, it was perfect. <laughs> he told me after one, he said, I don't think I'll ever get reelected in Iowa now. <laughs> I think he will. He's running at age 88 for reelection. Uh, he's on his game, he's not a lawyer, he's sharp as can be, and uh, I'm lucky to have him. So we, we've managed to get through a lot of serious issues because of that friendship and relationship. When people say to me, how can you possibly work with so-and-so? Nine times out of 10, it's because the Senate is uh, a very small boat with 100 Titanic egos. And the person you wanna push overboard tomorrow is the one who will save you in the boat to, uh, the next day. So you just gotta be thinking in most cases, not all, in most cases, as much as I don't like what that Senator's doing today, uh, I'm gonna curb my tongue, wait till tomorrow, I may need him uh, or her in, in a circumstance. So we've completed this week's uh, official questioning and opening statements and statements yesterday from the American Bar Association. And the nomination now goes to the full committee Monday, but the rule of the Senate Judiciary Committee is that uh, there are two rules worth noting. You can hold over any nomination for a week, so it automatically will be held over to the following Monday, which, Monday, which is April 4th. Uh, and secondly, and this is important, in order to vote on a nominee in the committee, you need two members of the minority party present. If they boycott the committee hearing, we cannot conduct business in, in terms of uh, holding a nomination, a vote on the nomination. But I believe, fingers crossed, that we will be able to get at least two Republicans who will show up for the actual hearing itself. Uh, and we can move forward from there. Uh, let me stop at this point. It's enough talk on my end of it and open it to your questions. It's a good time to do it? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. So we have our uh, SBA president, uh, Frederick T. Day Joshua, is going to be walking around invoking his inner Oprah with the microphone uh, <laughs> to answer your questions. I guess, hello? All right. Um, I guess I'll start with the question. Sure. Um, I'm a 3L. I'm graduating in May. As Professor MC stated, I'm the current SBA president. Um, and my question is just, uh, it's kind of simple. Do you believe that she will be confirmed and be the next Supreme Court Justice? Yes. 
Uh, I think we have um, solid support on the Democratic side. Uh, and if it's necessary, Kamala Harris can step in and, and make it official with her 5150 vote. I still haven't given up on the prospect of Republican support. I'm working Republicans very carefully and very quietly, uh, several of them. Uh, she has received bipartisan support before, last time through Collins, Murkowski of Alaska, and uh, Graham of South Carolina. By his questioning, I doubt that he's on board this time around, <laughs> but I, I, I'm still gonna talk to him. I, I talk to everybody. I think she can get bipartisan support. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Um, so I want to say I appreciate you not having the pre-sentencing put into the record, um, pre-sentencing report put into the record, but I wanted to know, um, is that something that you as the chair just automatically just get to say absolutely not? Can anyone like make that go into the record, anyone else? So the process starts when you have vacancy a discovery process. And sometimes it goes smoothly and sometimes there's a disagreement. The minority wants more information than the majority will turn over. Uh, in Kavanaugh's case, there were two or three years that he served in the White House. Uh, and in that capacity was the legislative traffic cop for the White House. We wanted to know what happened when he was a traffic cop. The Republicans hired a lawyer who said, I'll take a look at all that information. Came back, said, nothing there, keep moving. Wait a minute, we're not going to Look at it, no. So three years of his professional life in the White House, all the records were removed from deliberation before the committee. I, I don't think that was right, but we had similar discussions uh, in with this nominee and agreed on most everything but one thing, and that was whether or not emails and communications among the staff and members of the Sentencing Commission were going to be disclosed. And when we contacted the commission, they said, those are emails that say, uh, are we meeting at 8.30 or nine o'clock in the morning? You know, <laughs> they're routine. The deliberations, all of the transcripts, everything that has been said, all the votes that have been taken, here they are, 12,000 pages worth. Everything of an official nature was disclosed. So we didn't think that that discovery into that area was appropriate. Now comes this whole controversy over her sentencing uh, she sentenced, had imposed about 100 criminal sentences as a D.C. District Court judge. Uh, and among them were about 10 or 12 related to sexual misconduct involving children, child pornography and the like. And they have focused on two, really, uh, that out of, they started with 15, went to seven, went to five, went, came down to two, two of her sentences. And, dwelled on those over and over again. Senator Hawley in Missouri first raised it in his tweets uh, just a little over a week ago. Uh, and at the end of the day, it was pretty clear that those who were opposing her on that subject, we know where their votes are. They've got plenty of information. They have the transcripts of the, of the sentencing hearing. We didn't have those ever on the, on the Democratic side. We could have uh, obtained them, but we didn't. And so the last thing that Senator Cruz requested was the pre-sentencing reports. And I just said flat out, no, I'm not gonna do this. If you tell me that you care about the victims and innocent third parties whose names could be mentioned in these pre-sentencing reports, I am not gonna be party to making these part of the record here, even with your solemn pledges that nothing will ever leak concerning what's in those reports. I don't believe it for a minute. I really don't. I have lots of experience to back it up. And I will not have it on my conscience that some information that might leak out or be disclosed could jeopardize some innocent victim in this circumstance. And I just use them as, as an example. Imagine a troubled marriage, the, the father in the marriage engaged in this kind of conduct with one of the children in the marriage. Divorce has taken place, the father is in prison, the mother lives in dread. This little girl, as she grows up, is going to hear what happened in that case when they met in front of a Judge Jackson. And the pre-sentencing report, the mother was completely honest and talked about her relationship with the father and her concern about the daughter and other members of the family, on and on. Honest to goodness, there comes a point where we've got to draw a line. We have never asked for pre-sentencing reports. I don't think we should. And I've 
I really staked my chairmanship on it. I said, if you're asking and waiting for me to do this, here's the gavel. I'm not going to do it. Can they call me on it? Yes. And it, what it means is if they can get all of the Republicans to stand together on this, uh, we wouldn't have the two Republicans we need to vote on her nomination. I mean, that's the grim reality. But I have spoken to individual Republican senators who said, now that you've explained it, we're sorry we signed the letter that said we want this information. And Cruz and those who supported him have been silent ever since I raised this objection. I think they realize they're on the wrong, wrong side of the issue. I hope they realize. Yes, Senator Cruz. Well, this is a rarity on the Judiciary Committee that you actually consider a Supreme Court nominee. I think it's the seventh time I have, but I've been around a while, uh, for Pat Lay the 20th time or something like that. But for John Ossoff, who is new to the committee, it's the first. And naturally you think, wow, finally I get to ask somebody who could be on the Supreme Court some really fundamental questions about the Constitution and how they see it. You know, I feel the same way. Uh, if this were a different circumstance, I would like to explore some issues. Religion uh, under the Constitution today is a different subject than it was not that long ago. But there are a couple reasons why I can't. Uh, number one, uh, most judicial nominees, at Supreme Court level, refuse to give an opinion on something uh, because it may come before them in, in a case, and, and they they don't want to prejudice uh, uh, their own decision or anybody, any party to the case. And in this circumstance, uh, I, I take for example, yesterday, uh, Senator McConnell says, uh, I'm not voting for uh, Judge Jackson because she won't answer the question about packing the court, adding more Supreme Court justices. Interesting, because two things. Senator McConnell is the only person in Washington, certainly the only one in the Senate, who has ever willfully changed the composition of the court. After Scalia passed away, he kept that seat vacant in the hopes that a Republican would win the presidential election. He wouldn't give Obama the opportunity to fill the seat, which had been done throughout history. So he kept the court composition at eight instead of nine for political purposes. That was McConnell's actual design, and he was open about it. No surprise. Uh, in addition to that, Amy Coney Barrett, who he willfully supported, wholeheartedly supported, refused to answer the same question about packing the court as Judge Jackson. She said, I'm not gonna pine on that. That's a policy question. Congress makes the policy. I'm a judge who sits in, uh, in judgment of the policy based on constitution and the law. And he accepted that, that was fine. But that was the leading reason why he said yesterday he's voting against her. So that's kind of the lay of the land as we get into that circumstance. Yes? Quite, real quick, you will need to speak into the mic because they're recording. Good afternoon, my name is Erica Fatima. I'm a 3L here and um, thank you for uh, coming, Senator. Um, my question is, in this historic moment of having an Af African-American woman um, appointed to the Supreme Court, would you articulate what you think is the um, underlying, I guess, fear almost or apprehension of the opposition, why they're opposing her so to this extreme um, way? This president has set out to bring more diversity to the federal courts than ever in history. I, I don't know the exact numbers I sit here, but I think it's 48 judges now that we have processed through uh, the Judiciary Committee and uh, on on the floor. Overwhelmingly, they are uh, women and uh, people of color. 
we have now put more women of color on the DC, uh, on the federal circuit courts in the last year than the combined total in the history of the United States, okay? And the same thing is true about the Department of Justice. Uh, when you look at the leadership in the department, there are some extraordinary people and many of them are women of color. The observation I'm about to share with you is not mine alone. Other members of the committee on my side just shake their heads at it. There are members on the Republican side who, a few, who have a visceral reaction to assertive women of color. It is visceral. How can you explain that they voted against every single one of them? How can you explain that they continue to bring their names? How many times do we hear Vanita Gupta's name? I mean, she was one of the first people chosen by the committee, and yet they bring her up every hearing. And then there was Vanita Gupta, and then there was Vanita Gupta. And you think to yourself, get over it. You know, she's an extraordinary person, had to be, to get into this position. But I'm gonna just have to appeal to a psychologist or a sociologist or someone <laughs> to, to explain what is going on here. Some of this too, uh, unfortunately, reflects where America is today. Uh, I, I was proud as hell to support Barack Obama for president. I was the first senator to endorse him for president. For 14 months, I was the only senator who endorsed him for president. And then a few more, more joined him. Uh, and, and I was there when he was sworn in, uh, closer than you and I are at this moment, and saw him reach over and put his hand on Abraham Lincoln's Bible. And I thought to myself, in my lifetime, in my lifetime, finally, we're going to change. We're gonna see civil rights come to an, a new level of acceptance and discussion. I was partially right and I was partially wrong because as he inspired more people to think in broader terms about a color-free America, he also, I don't wanna use the word inspired, he motivated some to go in the opposite direction. The formation of groups that are still out there today, hateful, extremist, white supremacy groups, which the FBI uh, identifies as the biggest threat to civil uh, peace in America. Uh, came out of that same swearing-in ceremony. So uh, I don't have to tell you. Uh, this is an issue we're continuing to battle, but I think Joe Biden is doing the right thing uh, in establishing this diversity. And Mary Rowland, some of you know Mary Rowland, right across the street, federal uh, district court judge. God bless Mary Rowland. Uh, we nominated her to be on the district court out of the federal defender program 12, 14 years ago. And I couldn't get the Republican Senator from Illinois to support her uh, for a variety of reasons. She, she had represented a Guantanamo detainee. She had uh, defended people accused of terrorism after 9-11 who were found not guilty. Uh, she was openly gay and married with children uh, and she, she was a member of the Federal Defender Program, uh, and this Republican senator wouldn't sign the blue slip, which is necessary. So can you believe under the Trump administration, I put this card on the table and I said to the White House, this is our card. If you, if you wanna insist on these two or three people, you only get them if you, if you play this card. And they approved her. So what we're doing now is seeing more and more like her in terms of Federal Defender experience coming into the courts. That is a healthy thing. That is a healthy thing. You'd never believe if you listen to the Republicans who believe there should be only one table in the courtroom, not two. You know, they don't believe that anybody should be represented if, if they're accused of doing something controversial or illegal. That is just not what America is all about. You know that, I do too. It's one of the first things you learn when you walk through the door downstairs about the adversarial process and the administration of justice. So, we're seeing more diversity come of this, and she is a major step forward in that regard. But yes, there is a visceral reaction from some. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Hi, Senator. Hi, Senator Durbin. My name is Monielle. I'm a 1L here, and I'm actually interested in one day being counsel for a committee. I interned on the House Judiciary Committee, and I saw you were counsel for the State Senate Judiciary Committee. So can you talk about how you use your law degree and the differences in being a member versus being counsel? Well, uh, Ms. Johnson here 
here is one of our clerks by remote, a virtual service in this process. I thank you for being part of it. Uh, as I said, my law degree led to different things uh, in my life, probably different than many or any of you will experience. Uh, I started off working in the Illinois State Senate and as parliamentarian on the day-to-day -day operations of the Senate. I then was assigned uh, to be the legal counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee, which meant analyzing state proposed legislation and presenting um, my critiques, my comments to the individual state senators. Uh, of course, then got into the political realm, serving in the House of Representatives and then in the Senate, where I've gone in that direction. In the meantime, I really value the four or five years when I was a general practice lawyer. I really think uh, I came to understand the law a lot better by taking on cases and meeting clients in so many different areas. Some of you may have a law career that takes you into some specific area of the law. Uh, you may be handpicked by some major firm here in this town to research something of great importance. You may spend weeks, months, maybe longer in, on, on one case getting ready for this big settlement, usually, or big trial infrequently. Uh, it, it can take you in many different directions. But when I have people interning in my office, I often ask them what they want to do. And many say law school, and they say, what, do you, what is your vision? What does a lawyer do? What would you want to do as a lawyer? Very seldom do they say practice law. <laughs> Very seldom do they say, I want to go to a courtroom. But that was my life. Uh, I was a trial lawyer, and uh, uh, it, it was a great experience. Uh, there's nothing quite like it. And uh, I, I valued that. I thought that was the best part of my law practice. Senator Anthony Jackson, I'm a graduate from this fine institution. First of all, I want to thank you for your service. Sure. Uh, to get up every day for 40 years and make the decision that you are going to go and go to bat for the people of the state of Illinois is incredible. Uh, you and I both know you could have left 10 years ago and been making about at least 10 million a year by now. So <laughs> to stay there uh, and deal with some of your counterparts is, is incredible. Um, much is made about the length of service uh, of, of some of our elected officials. I know when I worked in the House of Representatives in Springfield, every session, uh, there were multiple term limit bills. Um, and as you know, you wouldn't be in a position that you're in as chairman of this committee were you not obviously a, a member held in high regard, but also uh, someone with quite some time of service. Can you talk about the value of uh, longevity and uh, just being a senior member and, and what that means to the people that you serve. Thanks. Uh, if you believe in this system of government, that decision is made by one group, the voters. The voters may decide that four years is too long. They may decide that 24 years isn't long enough. Uh, and they're the ones that get to decide, as they should. From my own personal point of view, I want to tell you, longevity is critical to effectiveness. Critical. Uh, in terms of who makes decisions in Washington. If you have a revolving door of service, states like California, for example, just change with some frequency, House and Senate, because of term limits. But if you have such a revolving door, you end up surrendering big decision-making outside of elected officials to bureaucrats and lobbyists. They're the ones who are around the longest. And they will say to you, Representative Jackson, I know you're new here. Let me explain to you what this bill is all about. I know you got to go on the floor and uh, say a few words about it here. Let me give you a little background on it. Yeah, <laughs> sure you do. And, and if the person you're talking to happens to say, I really appreciate your point of view, but I know this bill. Uh, I, I remember this bill from last session. And I'll tell you what I learned the second time I introduced this bill and why I changed this bill. And all of a sudden you're in a different relationship you're helpful, but you're not gonna determine the outcome. That individual elected official, because of their experience, knows a little bit more that can be added to it. Plus, you get to know how the place works, the procedures. You develop relationships with other members uh, that can lead to really positive outcomes. 
imagine this. I talked about Grassley before, and I sound like a cheerleader for him. Oh, i got to tell you a story. Years and years ago, Grassley and I had worked on a bill. Uh, it was the, the uh, bankruptcy reform bill. And uh, we'd gone through several years of uh, preparation, and the bill came up, and I couldn't support it. He passed it anyway. He had the votes and passed it. But I said something nice about him on the floor of the Senate uh, one day because he deserved it. So fast forward a year and a half, I get a phone call here in my Chicago headquarters, political headquarters. It's the president of the Iowa State AFL-CIO. He is madder than hell. Durbin, what are you doing endorsing Grassley in the Senate re-election race in Iowa? I said, I didn't endorse him. Oh, yes, you did. He sent out a brochure to every registered voter in Iowa, and there's your picture on it. And oh, right next to the picture is this quote, Chuck Grassley is a great statesman and I think he's a professional to work with. Signed, Richard Durbin. Now that goes to every house. Here we have a, a Democratic senator from Illinois endorsing a man. I'm supporting his Democratic opponent in Iowa and you're ruining everything. I said, I don't know where that came from. I, I really don't. And I'll check on it. Well, sure as hell I said it <laughs> on the floor of the Senate. And he put it in his brochure. You know, I can't deny it. So anyway, he gets reelected easily. It wasn't even close. It, I don't think it was my quote, believe me. And he comes back to the Senate, and I see him for the first time face to face after the election. I said, Grassley, what are you doing to me? You know, labor's my friend, and I, I work with him in Illinois, and now you got Iowa labor telling Illinois labor I'm a traitor and all this stuff. He said, well, you said it. <laughs> and I said, I said it. I said, but now I'm up for reelection. Now I need a quote from you. <laughs> he said to me, here, grabs, grabs a notepad, writes something down, hands it to me. Durbin's not as bad as you think. <laughs> but, but the point I'm getting to is that that relationship is so good that when I put in a bill to, to reverse the worst vote I ever cast, how many times you heard a senator or a representative say that? The worst vote I ever cast. It was uh, the drug war vote goes back 30 years. All of a sudden on the street was something called crack cocaine. It scared the living hell out of us. It was cheap, it was effective, and it's, it's evil doing. And it harmed the fetus and, and women who were uh, uh, pregnant. It was terrible. We saw this scourge coming across America of uh, cocaine in this form. And so we decided, at the same time, I might add parenthetically, a, an outstanding basketball player at the University of Maryland, Lynn Bias, who was destined for the NBA, overdosed on another drug, not on crack cocaine, but it just all seemed to come together at one time. And so we passed this god awful bill, uh, War Against Drugs, 100 to 1 sentencing disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine. We were going to get the message out loud and clear stay the hell away from crack cocaine. Uh, we'll put you away and throw away the key if you do it. That was going to stop people from doing this. What happened to the price of crack cocaine? You would think it went up after that. No, it went down. Well, how about the users? Did they go up or down? They went up. Exactly the opposite of what we thought. So for more than 20 years, we filled the federal prisons primarily with African-American prisoners and destroyed lives and families in the process. Just sure as hell. The bill when it was voted on had liberals like me, had members of the Black Caucus voting for it, but boy, we sure saw what, did, what it did, and it was terrible. So I got in the Senate and said, I'm changing this thing. I, I've got to find a way to change it. Uh, and so I put in a bill one-to-one -one, called the Equal Act now. Uh, Cory Booker has it, and I gave it to him. But I said we're going to get back to one-to-one. -to -one. And my nemesis on that was a fellow named Jeff Sessions. Ring the bell? Jeff Sessions was in the, the Senate Judiciary Committee, and he was against me. He said, I'm going to stop your bill, and one senator can stop a bill. So I'm pleading with him, getting nowhere. So comes the day when we're going to mark up the bill in committee. Who do I run into in the Senate gym in the morning but Jeff Sessions? I go to the gym every morning for no apparent reason. And uh, I see him coming in. He's getting dressed to go into the gym. And I said, Jeff, come on. Let's reach an agreement on this bill. I don't want that bill. And I said, if you can't do one to one, what can you do? 25 to one. And I said, make it 10 to one. No. I says, he said, maybe 20. I said, make it 15. No. 
How about 18? Okay. We agreed on that number, 18 to one in the gym. It went through the committee on a voice vote, went through the floor on a voice vote in the Senate. Same thing happened in the House. It was signed in a signing ceremony with Durbin, Sessions, and Obama in the White House and nobody else. It was, <laughs> he didn't want any publicity that he'd even agreed to 18 to one. And so as a result, thousands of inmates were released when the Sentencing Commission made this retroactive. And, and that's an example of getting something done on a bipartisan basis. Could have been stopped by one senator. Same thing happened with the First Step Act. Signed into law by Donald Trump, my co-sponsor, Chuck Grassley, takes away the mandatory minimum sentencing uh, mandates for simple possession. You know, and thousands, literally thousands, uh, lives are affected by this. So you got to be there for that day. And had I not had a long history with some of these senators, that day might not have happened. You know that better than anybody. Senator, um, I have two issues. The first is about religion. Why do we keep circling religion? And, and how is it that a senator can say, I go to church three times a year and, and yet ask the candidate about their religion with a straight face. The second issue is, why are we trying to define female? And, and I personally, having been a female all my life, I, I, I was watching the TV throwing socks at it. Um, so I'd like to know what the genesis of the female issue is and where that is in the court that, that suddenly we're all concerned about my gender. Okay, on religion, I, I, I'm sorry that Lindsey Graham asked the question the way he did. I don't think he was looking for a direct answer. He was trying to make a point that Amy Coney Barrett's religious beliefs had been attacked by the same committee. I think that was what it was really all about, uh, trying to explain where he goes. It was a, it, it was a painful question to ask someone, what is your religion? And how often do you go to church? Honest to goodness. I mean, just getting back to the basics of this constitution, that shouldn't be an issue at all. It only came up in her case because of the extraordinary circumstance of what she had published. And it raised that question on religion. I will also tell you though, that the, the more conservative politicians in America are starting to view uh, religion, not as a shield so much as a spear so that they can assert uh, that they can decide that their employees will not have health insurance covering family planning because they personally, as owners of the business, don't believe in family planning. That's pretty close to a case, isn't it? And, and what we've dealt with before. Uh, interesting thing about that is, uh, w w if, if you're going to take that to uh, back into the, the uh, history of the United States, when the territory of Utah wanted to become a state, we required several things of them. Turning over a certain portion of the land, the majority of the land, as public land. They had to declare that this part was public land in the new state of Utah. But the second thing we required of them is that they pass a law banning polygamy in the state of Utah. Now, how about that? Now there is a closely held personal religious belief which the Congress decided and Utah went along with saying we're gonna change it. You know, that may be somebody's belief, but it's not going to be our official policy any longer uh, in our state. Now we're reaching a point where that's being used on questions involving everything under the sun. The Affordable Care Act's provisions on birth control, uh, questions uh, about the practice of religion, uh, whether people have to bake birthday cakes for gay marriage and so forth uh, and the like. Uh, and that's why. In, in a different setting, I would have loved to explore what she thought about that. I'd love to hear more from some of the other uh, justices about it. Now on the question which seemed foolish on its face, what is a woman? It's all about transgender policy and whether or not biological personhood is the same as legal personhood. Uh, it was asked inartfully and it, so it sounded, as you said, that you wanna throw something at the screen. But what she was trying, I think that's where she was headed. We now have cases in Florida where a uh, transgender female wins an athletic, athletic contest, swimming, I believe. Pardon me? And the, 
the governor of the state has declared that it's void. Uh, so that's where she was headed in that case. And it's part of, step back a second, why are they dwelling so much on child crimes? Because QAnon has got this bizarre notion about the trafficking of children. Remember Pizzagate when they were, sent somebody with a gun to go into a pizza restaurant in Washington because they believe they were trafficking in children in the basement of the restaurant or some craziness like that. QAnon, that's one of their core beliefs. So their theories are being fed by the questions that are asked by the senators here. And the same thing is true in the culture wars here. In many respects this week uh, has been a testing ground for the Republicans on the issues they want to use in November or want to develop for the next presidential election. They're trying to build the case. If you put a gun to my head and said, Durbin, what is the definition of critical race theory? I'd say, pull the trigger, I don't know. <laughs> but they seem to think we get up every morning, liberals do, and say, how can I impose critical race theory on America today? You know, it is a big, passionate uh, organizing tool for them. And it came up frequently this week because of that. Someone has a question. One more question, Keisha? Thank you for being here with us today. Um, I had a question somewhat related to a previous answer, but as we're working through um, like a very pivotal time in our country, um, breaking the status quo in general and all facets of our lives, I think a lot of us, a lot of people try to um, remain in bipartisanship and in moderation and the ideology of being a moderate, if you will. Um, so what do you think the future of that, of bipartisanship in general is uh, based on just extremities in the legislative branch? It is a big problem, serious problem. The divisions in America, right and left, uh, and the center stripe in American politics is getting narrower every year. Part of the problem is uh, information. Where do you get your information? Is it reliable? Is it accurate? And if you live in a world of one source of news, if you live in a Fox world or you live in an MSNBC world, uh, you're gonna get a different view of the world completely depending on where you stay. And ultimately, it's going to affect you personally, your beliefs, your conduct, your attitude towards others. Uh, I feel it, I see it, I believe it we are really breaking into armed camps. And I use the word armed advisedly because there's more and more weaponry in, involved in this political discussion than any time in modern memory. Uh, there are exceptions to the rule and I think we have to make a point of them. I talked a lot about Chuck Grassley, bills uh, that I've worked on with him. I could name a dozen, two dozen Republican senators where I'm actively working with them. John Cornyn, Okay, you know John Cornyn, former Attorney General in Texas and Supreme Court Justice. John and I were at a hearing last week. Immigration is a subject near and dear to me. I introduced the DREAM Act 21 years ago. I still need to pass it, but I'm working on it. And it, it looked like we were at loggerheads, and I finally said, John, you and I have, a, at this subcommittee hearing, you and I have a bill on immigration. Yes, we do. I said, we got a lot of co-sponsors. Let's put that bill on the table and see if there are other bills like it that can get 60 votes. 60, that means at least 10 Republicans. And he said, we'll do it. And we're gonna do it as soon as they're finished with this. There has to be more of that. And we obviously have to tell the American people there's more of that, uh, that there is room for agreement between the two parties. That's why I, I really sincerely hope that we have bipartisan uh, support for Ju Judge Jackson. Uh, it would be a shame if this historic record-breaking uh, nomination were to come down on strict party lines. It shouldn't. Her qualifications are so good. Uh, she is such a good person and she has been approved over and over and over again by this committee. And if we can get a bipartisan vote for her, even just a few Republicans to support her, I think it helps a lot. But I don't quarrel with your premise. Information and where people get it. Right now in Russia, you see what's going on. Putin is making sure that anyone who uses the war is a, the word war is arrested. And so that's horrible. We know what's going on in Ukraine. It's clearly a war. And they are 
making certain that their news media doesn't report it to the Russian people, not telling them about the, the Russian soldiers who are being killed and refusing to let them use the word war. Uh, unfortunately, there are some commentators in America who are complicit in that. It's almost impossible to believe that would have been unthinkable in previous conflicts. Rare, if ever, to occur. But it seems now that the divisions of America have created that. Good question. Well, that's thanks, Senator Durbin, for Thank coming you. to see us today. Thank you so much.